it is now time for questions to the Minister of Education. I can advise members that listed questions number 9 and 13 have been withdrawn. I call Pat Ramsey. Mom, Deputy Speaker. <coughs> the Delivering Social Change programme was announced by the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister in October 2012. The programme was only made possible because of central funding provided by OFMDFM. In the absence of central funding, I have had to end both the OFMDFM programme and the DE expansion programme at the end of August 2015. In addition, some participating schools have, had, have, had, have not had the benefit of an additional teaching resource for a full two years or until March 2016, whichever was the sooner. The expenditure for the programme was incurred by the Education Authority in respect of the payment of teachers' salaries and administration costs up to the end of August 2015, when their employment ceased. Work is ongoing to finalise the accounts for the programme up to the end of August 2015. The funding already provided by OFM, DFM and by my department appears to be sufficient to cover the costs incurred. My commitment to the programme is such that I have already set aside an additional 200000 to ensure that the best practice and learning developed and identified during this programme can be disseminated across all schools and create a lasting legacy for the Delivering Social Change programme. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, and I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, Minister, it is obviously an area that you have been uh, heard you on media on it, but it is still a concern to many parents that their own children at early years are not getting the appropriate holistic, individually tailored plans that are necessary for, for a child's progression. Could you uh, outline what steps the Department has taken to effectively bring forward a more strategic approach? to ensure that a child's development at an early stage has been progressed consistently? I don't necessarily accept that many children are not getting the, the appropriate uh, interventions at early years. In, in any system such as one as expansive as the Department of Education, where there, there will be uh, different degrees of provision within, within the schools, and my job as Minister in the role of the Department of Education is to ensure that all provision uh, is brought up to the highest level possible. We do have tailored interventions in place. Our curriculum is tailored to ensure that education is delivered at early years, age appropriate and individual appropriate uh, to pupils to ensure and support them through their development of education from the earliest years possible. Uh, the, the Developing Social Change programme was targeted towards our primary schools and our post primary schools, and over its two years, it was a very effective programme. But when budgets are reduced, you have decisions to make. OFM, DFM had their decisions to make. I had my decisions to make. Uh, you know, I, I could have diverted funds away from schools to continue the developing social change programme. But in fact, what I was what I'd be doing was paying off teachers to bring in other teachers. And I didn't think that made sense at this time. The lessons from the DSE programme are being learnt. They're being disseminated, and they will be shared across our education. Uh, establishment to ensure that everyone learns the best practice from them. Call me of McLaughlin. I'll ask him quarter, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I, I note that the Minister has referred to the lessons that are learned from delivering social change, but I could ask maybe to outline what the Department are going to do to harness that learning in relation to you know, benefit in schools a, a, across the North. For a moment. As I outlined, I have set aside £200,000 to carry out this work. Uh, in this year. In the most successful schools, the le this learning has been shared across the curriculum, and many principals are already trying to mainstream the approaches learnt under the DSE programme. Uh, the legacy programme will be delivered during the 15 16 academic year. The programme uh, aims to prepare and collate resources and best classroom practice identified by education authority officers during the programme provide information for school principals on successful approaches to tackling underachievement, provide CPD, continuous professional development sessions on English and our numeracy interventions for our English and maths coordinators and, and, and teachers in every school, prepare and present case studies of best practice, identify the ETI and the evaluation process, along with a number of other measures. So, uh, the lessons learned from DSC will definitely not be lost to our system, and they will be uh, built in and tailored to our schools as we move forward. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what assessment has been made of the worth of these signature projects with regard to literacy and numeracy? And how can the Minister address underachievement when the first thing to be cut is this programme? 
Firstly, we have to recognise that our education system is there to address underachievement. It should not be an add-on. It certainly, certainly should not be a separate programme or a scheme that you come up with. The core purpose of education is to educate to the individual, to meet the needs of the individual child, and to nurture the child's development and learning uh, at every stage of its education. That is the core, core principle. And once we get into a philosophy or an idea or a mindset that to tackle underachievement you need yet another programme, then I think you are going down the wrong road and wrong direction. It has to be the very core of education. The ETI are evaluating uh, the numeracy and literacy programme um, and will continue to evaluate and disseminate best practice throughout our schools along with the Education Authority. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you. Uh Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, does he, he, does he accept that there is some evidence, substantial evidence in my opinion, that there is underachievement among young Protestant boys? Does he have any measures or has he taken cognizance of this and how does he intend addressing that? Of course there is evidence uh, which proves that there is underachievement. It does not suggest it proves. There is ed educational underachievement in young uh, Protestant boys. Uh, uh, and our education system, as I said in response to the previous questioner, has to be targeted about the needs of the individual and it has to be set in a way where we nurture and develop the educational well-being and development of every individual child. So do we need a separate uh, strategy around Protestant working class boys solely for education? No. What we need is a, a, a combined strategy around working class communities, Protestant and Catholic, because the figures in the Catholic community are not impressive either. In fact, the figures somewhere in the region of 457 working class Protestant boys left school without proper qualifications in 1415. In the same year, 909 Catholic working class boys left education without proper qualifications. So we need to target resources, which I have done and which was opposed by members opposite, uh, to schools in socially deprived areas. We need to ensure that the executive as a whole, and it is, targeting resources to socially deprived areas to, to build up community confidence and infrastructure, uh, because education, as is the case in health, you will find uh, social deprivation breeds educational inequalities, and we need to ensure that we remove the inequalities in society to ensure education uh, prospers as well. But I believe that the, we have the policies in place to tackle educational underachievement, because it is the very heart of our education system. Moving on, I call Leslie Cree. Question two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> For September 2015 entry, over 21,000 pupils transferred from primary to post-primary schools. By the end of the process in May, 99.4% of pupils were placed in a school of their choice, with 86.7% being admitted to their first preference school. The department has published guidance setting out a framework for the transfer process. This guidance has been in place since 2010, which was the first year that children were not subjected to a state-sponsored transfer test. The guidance strongly recommends that schools do not use criteria related to academic ability. It goes on to recommend a menu of non-academic admissions criteria from which boards of governors of post-primary schools should draw in deciding their admissions criteria. This includes giving priority to children in receipt of free school meals, those with a sibling currently attending the school, and applicants who are the eldest child. It also includes geographic criteria relating to feeder primary schools or a Neon Parish or a catchment area, all to be used in conjunction with the nearest suitable school to ensure that rural children are not disadvantaged. It is my belief that the transfer process, as experienced by parents and children, will be much further if all schools follow the Department's guidance and cease the use of academic selection and rejection for admission into schools. I call Leslie Cree for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but, Minister, would you not agree that what you have done is actually effectively privatise the transfer system? No. Uh, those boards of governors who make a conscious decision every year, every year at a board of governors meeting, a board of governors should be setting its entrance criteria. So every board of governors that sits down and decides not to use academic selection follows a pathway which does not reject any child based on a do dossier. Those schools who decide at a Board of Governors meeting 
to follow down the pathway of academic selection decide to use dodgy dossiers to admit children to their school because there's no educational reason for doing it. There is a social reason for doing it. And if it is for social selection, then those who support it should stand up and say so. This is for social selection. It's not for educational selection. And those who defend and make excuses for those schools are responsible for, if you, as you term it, the privatisation of admissions criteria. I, for one, campaign on a daily basis to bring that process to an end. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And I must say that I find it unacceptable that the Minister uses such a statement as dodgy dossiers in relation to the, the selection procedure. Does the Minister agree that, in the main, the system works extremely well because we don't have education authorities or boards involved in it? The fact that they're kept out of it, the system works extremely well. And in the main, Protestant and Catholic parents are happy with it, in the main. The, the member stands in an elected assembly as an elected representative who is charged with holding public funds to account and makes the statement that the system works better because the education authorities and boards, etc., keep out of it. Now, that is probably one of the most undemocratic statements I have ever heard in this chamber. Because then, what is the purpose of this chamber? What is the purpose of elected representatives? What is the purpose of the ballot box if we do not elect politicians to govern our society? That's what we're all about. That's what this chamber is about. But in terms of does, that, does the system work well? No, it doesn't work well. And the evidence is in the Equality Commission, draft Equality Commission report published only a fortnight ago. The evidence is in the, the report published by the OECD two years ago. The evidence is in the United Nations uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. The evidence is in the, the Human Rights Commission. The evidence is in uh, the evidence presented by the trade union movement. The evidence is in the trail of underachievement in working class communities because we ignore the international evidence around this matter for social selection purposes. Not for educational purposes social selection purposes, because there is no evidence or educational evidence that backs up academic selection, none whatsoever. But there's plenty to back it up for social selection. And parties such as yourselves, who once in the mid-80s who were opposed to academic selection on the basis of social selection, need to go back to your previous position. I call Chris Hazard. Asking Colin and thank the ministers for his answer thus far. Can I ask the minister, bear in mind that now more than two thirds of schools have moved away from selection uh, and do not have any academic selection at age 10. What progress has been, mo been made in moving that final rump of schools who insist on the social selection process to move away from it? I, I believe there has been a change in attitudes uh, to academic selection, particularly in the Catholic sector. And that has been driven, in fairness, to the position taken by a number of groups. One, the Catholic bishops, and two, the Catholic Principals Association, who have been driving the agenda forward and reminding those people in their sector that academic selection is not only educationally wrong, but in the words of the Catholic bishops, is also morally wrong. So there is a shift moving away from uh, this so-called academic selection, which is, in fact, uh, social selection and sets in basis of equality uh, and the foundations. Mr Speaker, it's very difficult to hear or to talk when others are having a full blown conversation. I will judge when I think it's appropriate to intervene. As the minister, does the minister wish to continue or have you finished? Well, with respect to the speaker, I, I was just making you aware it was very difficult to hear. So it was, uh, I wasn't asking you to intervene. Uh, so we ask that uh, there will be further schools in the time ahead move away from academic selection. There is greater public opinion. If you lose an example of how public opinion changes matters, there was a vote in this chamber yesterday which a year ago was unachievable. But it was made achievable because activists who believe in equality made it so. So there is a responsibility on the trade union movement. There is a responsibility on the political parties who are opposed to academic selection in this chamber. There is a responsibility on civic society to campaign against academic selection. Moving on, I call Patsy McLoan. Uh, question number three. 
I am aware of the health and well-being issues faced by teachers in our schools today and the importance of addressing them if we are to retain a committed, motivated and healthy teaching workforce. The responsibility for the health and well-being of teachers rests with their employers, the Board of Governors, in conjunction with the employing authority where relevant. The employing authorities and the teachers' unions work together through the Teachers' Negotiating Committee to tackle issues which impact on teachers' health and well-being. My department is also part of the TNC. Over the recent years, a number of measures have been introduced to support teachers' health and well-being, including the development of a strategy for teachers' health and well-being, a policy statement on tackling violence and abuse against teachers, a workload agreement, a teacher's attendance procedure, which includes a new provision for the recording of incidences of work-related stress, an independent 24-hour confidential telephone counselling service for all teachers provided by Curacol, a flexible working scheme, a job share, job share scheme, a career break scheme, temporary variation of contracts, and a policy statement on planning, preparation and assessment time. Notwithstanding all of this, I want to assure members that this is a matter of the utmost importance to me. Most recently, I have personally endorsed the reinvigoration of the Teachers' Health and Wellbeing Working Group of the TNC. I now expect to see a clear, agreed action plan outlining specific activities for my department, employers, employing authorities and the unions to take on in partnership to tackle this critical issue. I call Patsy McGlone for supplementary. Uh, thanks very much to the Minister for, for that particular response. Um, could, could I ask the Minister what particular steps have been taken by ETI to minimise the occurrence or impact of stress during their school inspections? Well, there has been engagements between ETI and the unions, which has seen a change even in terms of how we report on our uh, inspections. And I understand that inspections are stressful uh, for teachers and for schools. Um, though we often hear of the negative side of inspections. Every year I host an event in the long gallery upstairs where uh, maybe 100, 150 schools are present who are presented with certificates for outstanding good uh, inspections. And the pride in that room uh, is unbelievable, among, and quite rightly so, among those teaching staff, the principals, the Board of Governors. But yet the media or no one else ever reports on that. Inspections are good, in my opinion, for schools. They are good for the education system, and yes, they should be carried out in a respectful manner. They should be carried out in a manner which does not cause undue stress uh, to the schools or to the teachers, etc. But they are there for the benefit of our education system, and we learn from the best practice. We share the best practice, and we want to see all our young people being taught in schools which live under that uh, heading of every school a good school. I called back Ian Mackay. I can ask, Ankara, can I ask the Minister what action has the Department has taken to address the health and wellbeing needs of the non-teaching staff uh, within our schools? Uh, in respect of non-teaching staff in schools, there is a suite of HR policies and procedures in place to support health and wellbeing. A number of agreements have been negotiated with the trade unions, which are family-friendly and recognise the competing pressures on staff. Some of the examples are all staff of 24 counselling support and individual counselling services provided by Curacol on behalf of the Education Authority. In addition, the Authority employs welfare officers who are available to support staff and signposting to specialist services which can provide further support uh, for individual staff. Grievance procedures and harassment and bullying policies are in place, as is whistleblowing policies for circumstances where staff require formal mechanisms, or require formal mechanisms for having any grievance or concern addressed. Call Trevor Lum. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, just on the back of Mr. McGlone's question, Minister, uh, he actually asked a question I wanted to ask. But uh, to develop that slightly, uh, anecdotally, what we hear is that school inspections obviously are very stressful, but that uh, when the inspection is concluded, the school is left with an impression of the result, which isn't finally recorded when, when the final report comes through. Is the Minister aware of that, that the hopes are raised and then dashed effectively? Um, I, I receive varying commentary from schools around inspections. Um, and I can't verify every report I receive, uh, but the majority of reports I receive from schools are good around inspections. Yes, there's a period of worry leading up to the inspection. Yes, there's concern while the inspection is taking place. But once the inspection is complete, uh, schools 
report back that they are satisfied or happy with the way procedures are carried out. A number of, of individual schools have different commentary around that, would uh, question what they've been told and then what ends up in the final report, etc. Et but I, I come back to the point, uh, I believe inspections are good for our education system at this time. Um, and our, our, our ETI are professionals, they carry out uh, their duties in a professional manner and their reports uh, whether good or bad, need to be taken on board by the schools and lessons learned from them. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Number four, Deputy Speaker. The Board of Governors of each school uh, funded under the Common Funding Scheme is responsible in law for the management of the school's financial allocation. The Board of Governors is expected to manage the school in accordance with memoranda and guidance issued by the relevant funding authority. The Board of Governors may delegate certain activities to the principal in accordance with the school's financial memorandum. When employers do not have to specify any particular qualifications on budget management for prospective or serving principals, it is not unusual for essential criteria relating to principals post to include a management qualification at postgraduate level. Outside of formal qualifications, there is an expectation that both those seeking to undertake the role of principal or a ready in a principal's post will have skills and knowledge in relation to the budget management. These skills will have been gained in undertaking leadership roles at middle and senior levels within schools and or through training, including the professional qualification for headship. For those aspiring to be a principal or as part of an induction provision for newly appointed principals. I call Robin Newton for supplementary. I thank the Minister uh, for his answer. I wonder, Minister, could you explain, uh, given the, uh, what you have outlined in terms of uh, the principal's role, uh, which is separate from the principal's roles within special schools, and why the principal of special schools can't actually achieve the same standard of management of his or her whole budget uh, within the school uh, from the commencement of the academic year? Uh, special schools are funded in a different manner from um, grant funded schools under the common funding scheme and that is why. Uh, we, have, we have a number of funding schemes set out uh, in our education system. We have funding schemes for voluntary, uh, voluntary grammar and voluntary integrated schools. We have funding schemes under the, the, the common funding scheme and we have funding scheme for our special schools as well. It's, it's a different process. I call Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Minister, thank you for your answer so far. And I agree that professional qualification for headship is an important, uh, is important uh, qualification. But I suppose, what practical help is out there for newly appointed principals in terms of developing their budget skills, particularly you know, mentoring or coaching by experienced principals and things like that? Well, the, the important aspect of, of, of this question and, and answer is the budget management of the school is the responsibility of the Board of Governors. And they are there to work with and support and uh, manage the school. And, and the powers may be delegated to the principal. But let me repeat, the Board of Governors of each school, funded under the fund, common funding scheme, is responsible in law for the management of the school's financial allocation. So it's Board of Governors' responsibility, not simply the principal's responsibility, but in response to the other part of your question, just newly qualified principals do receive support, support through mentoring programmes, uh, etc., but they should also be receiving support from their Board of Governors as well. Moving on, I call Gordon Dunn. Question number five, Mr Deputy Speaker. Due to the number of factors, including sustainability and area planning considerations, the Hollywood Multi Schools pro project has not been included of any main, in any of my announcements to date for new capital bills. In order for the project to be taken forward, it would need to be included in a future capital announcement. Any such announcement would be dependent on the capital budget available to education in the next budget, budget cycle, April 16 onwards. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer to date. Uh, does the Minister fully recognise the need for the new build schools in Hollywood? Appreciate they did visit them some time ago. Uh, the, the Priory College, Nursery and Hollywood Primary. And I, you know, I would once again reiterate that the five schools in the town are all over 50 years of age. And does he recognise the need for investment to address how we've been uh, under-resourced for many years? 
I recognise the need for a new build programme in Hollywood. There's no argument in that. The point is when we have sufficient funds to carry the projects forward. We have numerous schools uh, waiting new builds, um, and I would welcome members' support in uh, lobbying for an increase to the capital budget uh, for education, and even for the next term, uh, when, when I won't be minister, I think education deserves an uplift in its capital budget. I believe the investment benefits not only uh, the school and the school community, but also it benefits our, our local economy as well. So, I, I, yes, the schools require new build. To achieve that, we require more capital. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, in addition to support for investment across the, the Hollywood Multi Schools project, can I ask the Minister if he acknowledges that prior integrated college is in need of uh, planning and capital funding assistance? And would he agree that there is an oversubscription uh, with regards to integrated education in neighbouring education areas? And on those grounds, will he assure the House that he will stand and deliver for integrated post primary provision in this area? <laughs> Well, I have already said to uh, Mr Dunn the schools in Hollywood require a new build. That includes Priory. Uh, I am not going to go into whether there is an oversubscription or underprovision uh, in, in the wider area for schools. I have already visited the school. I have met the principal on more than one occasion. I have met the Board of Governors on more than one occasion. And yes, we require to build a new Priory College. To do that, I require money. Uh, and there are many, many schools in the system that require new builds. It's getting around to them all. I call Peter Weir. Question number six. Uh, I am currently engaged in discussions with teacher trade union representatives in an effort to resolve the current action of non-participation in the statutory assessment process. I uh, thank the Minister for probably giving a very succinct answer in relation to that. Can I ask the Minister what consideration is being given, given the fact that the, one of the major areas of, of problem here is the lack of confidence amongst teachers in the assessment process? Uh, what consideration has been given to have a greater level of direct input from teachers in future design of uh, key stage assessments? Um, well, I, I do acknowledge the, the brevity. Of the answer, but sometimes it's less said, easiest made in these circumstances because we are involved in detailed negotiations with the unions. And I think both sides have approached this uh, negotiation with a mindset of resolving it, and I hope that mindset remains in place and then we will be able to resolve it. Central to our discussions has been um, the work on the teacher professional judgment in levels of progression and reassuring teachers and putting in place mechanisms that put at the centre of. Uh, the levels of progression, that is the judgment of the teacher, which is central, and in conjunction and working with his or her colleagues in the school is how we would moderate them, and then how we would moderate those in, again in conjunction with the professional judgment of neighbouring schools. And that is what is at the centre of our discussions, and I am attempting to offer reassurances uh, to the unions as to how that would be achieved. I call Sandra Overend. Speaker, um, I feel that I should inform the Minister that uh, different education authority areas have made differing recommendations uh, to schools who have applied for these projects. And some are proceeding with their projects in good faith that the funding will, will be forthcoming and others aren't. Will the Minister seek not only to find a resolution but to ensure that there is a uniform message to all schools and to all tranches throughout this system? Well, I would certainly expect one message coming out from the education authority. Uh, regardless of uh, the location of a school or, or the location of the office where the advice is coming from. I will follow that matter up to make sure there is singular advice and uh, recommendations coming out of the Education Authority. But I can as I have assured Mr Weir, or I attempt to assure Mr Weir, uh, that I am doing my utmost to bring this matter to a resolution. And that is the end of our time for listed questions. And we may now move on to topical questions. Uh, and I call uh, David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister um, to advise the House what uh, weight he believes should be put on the, uh, the aspect of parental choice in the decision making for a child to be sent to a particular school. Well, the legislation actually refers to parental preference. 
Choice has entered uh, the common terminology around these matters, but the legislation refers to parental preference. I am supportive of parental preference, but against parental preference, you also have to uh, bear in mind when evidence points you in a direction which suggests that a type of education or a type of admissions criteria within education is damaging the education system, then I think there's a responsibility on legislators and decision makers to rectify that. I call David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister may be relieved to know that I'm not actually going in the road of academic selection with this particular question. In, in relation to pre, uh, parental preference, as he puts it, um, in my own constituency of Ballymena, parental preference was uh, that less places would be required for Cambridge House Grammar School, which I know the Minister approved. However, that has not been the case with Slemmage College, which has consistently found itself oversubscribed uh, and there clearly is an appetite amongst parents um, to move towards that. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, does the Minister have any intention um, to mitigate uh, the uh, reduction in places in Cambridge House to the advantage of Slemish College, where there is a huge demand and parental preference is very clear? I ask the Education Authority in, in this context to bring forward a plan uh, for post-primary provision in the Ballymena area uh, and the wider area of Ballymena, uh, because while we've made decisions in around Cambridge House, around Ballymena Academy, that is not the finished plan, or should it be the finished plan. We need to ensure that there is a sustainable post-primary provision in that area. In regards to Slamish College, it's up for the only way to increase numbers substantially out of school is through a development proposal. That's brought forward by uh, the Education Authority, and then it's brought under my consideration under a two-month public consultation. Uh, process. So I, I could not make any predetermined decision in regards to that, but I have asked the Education Authority to take a look at post primary provision in that area. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister to provide the House with an update on the implementation of the creation of the Control uh, Schools sectoral support body, and in particular the timescale for departmental funding of that body? Um, as the member will be aware, work is progressing to establish a control school support body, uh, which was agreed by the executive in 2014 and then through legislation uh, in this House. A business case to support the establishment and funding of the council has been completed. Uh, a contract for the funding is being prepared and will certainly shortly be issued to enable uh, the control school sector support body to be formally established. I call Peter Weir for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. Can I ask the Minister what impact he believes the creation of the Control Schools sectoral support body will have on the teaching appointment scheme for uh, control schools? Um, well, a, a positive impact, <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> um, I understand that the, <laughs> the Education Authority has put in place measures ahead of the, the, the creation of the Control Schools sectoral support body in regards to uh, the formal processes that have been in place for the, the appointments teacher appointments committee, but I, I don't see any difficulties moving forward in the teacher appointments committee uh, and the setting up of the control circle support body. I, I just, when I say positive, but I'm serious, it will have a positive impact. I call Pat Simplone. Good last come, colleagues. Mui, Hislationaire. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister as well. <clears throat> Could I ask the Minister for an update on the provision of accommodation for Kilronan Special School in Maharfelt? I have recently signed off in correspondence uh, to the member in relation to this matter, uh, and I am happy to provide him with a further update, uh, but he will understand that there is quite a, <laughs> a considerable amount of correspondence that comes through my department, uh, but I am aware I think I signed off in correspondence for you yesterday. I do not have the full detail in front of me. I hope that it is positive. Um, is the minister aware of the pressing and urgent need for accommodation at that particular school, and if he could give me some idea as to when uh, monies would be released from his department for the provision of that accommodation? I have been lobbied by a number of MLAs in relation to this specific school uh, and the accommodation needs around it. And I don't wish to sound like a broken record, and it's not an easy reply to give or just dismissive reply to give. The reality is I do not have sufficient funds in the capital budget within my department to deal with the outstanding, urgent needs of our schools across the estate. Uh, and we have had to put in place uh, measures and policies to meet, them, to meet uh, health and safety uh, and disability access in a number of schools. But as I have said to the member, I have outlined them in correspondence to the current position. 
and I'm more than happy to give him a further update once available. Joe McAllister is not in his place. I call Stephen Mudry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update in relation to what his department are doing to tackle underachievement in Protestant working class children in school? Uh, I, I believe the policies that my department have in place will, are and will tackle educational underachievement. Uh, the issues surrounding Protestant working class boys go beyond education, uh, though education has a role to play, but they go beyond the school gates. And I, I acknowledge and recognise a number of, it, of measures being taken by community groups in working class Protestant areas to tackle the educational underachievement. And I think there are rests. Uh, the additional work which will assist us in breaking down the educational underachievement of Protestant working class boys. I thank the Minister for his uh, response, and I, I, I do to some extent agree with him. But the recent Equality Commission report was quite damning, and it said that standards are worse now than they were in 2007. Will he work with his other departments and bring it to the executive to see that this issue is addressed and addressed with a sense of urgency? Well, the Equality Commission report is a draft report, and I have met the Equality Commission on the report and have discussed some of the language which was used and some of the language which was attributed to them uh, around the report. Standards are not worse now than they were in 2007. That's a fact. Uh, our educational underachievement uh, is decreasing, not at the rate any of us would like. But if I give you an example of, of, of young people uh, on uh, free school meals and entitlement, where we measure these matters. Last year, 5% more young people in that category received five good, GS, good GCSEs than they did the year previous, and the year previous was an increase on the year previous to that. So matters cannot be worse in regards to this area than they were in 2007. There is areas of, of inequality where uh, there are concerns around it. it's going the wrong direction rather than the right direction. But in terms of educational underachievement, whether it be in Protestant working class boys or Protestant working class communities, or the other working class communities, we are beginning to see the trend going up in terms of improvement. Uh, but I emphasise, I believe the educational policies and steps I have taken will ta help tackle this matter. But in terms of the work which is being carried out by a number of community groups in Protestant working class communities, that is where the answer lies and that is where we need to show support. I call William Humphrey. Um, Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister? The Minister will be aware I have raised with him before the issue of Edenderry Nursery School in Greater Shankill, which is currently part of the estate at Glenwood Primary School. The contractor was meant to be on site in September of this year and is not. I understand there are issues between officials in your department and the Belfast Region of the Education Authority. Can the Minister assure me in this House that those issues will be resolved as soon as possible and construction will start in the new year, as I have been told? Uh, well, I can assure you that my officials have concerns that. The record will show in terms of capital projects that they will move quite, very quickly to resolve them. I am not aware of what the, exactly the issues are, but as in any uh, a dispute, and I use the word advisory, it will take both sides to resolve it. Call William Humphrey for supplementary. The Minister will be aware that in that question, uh, first question, I, I thank him for his answer. I raised the issue of Glenwood Primary School. Uh, the Minister will know that I have raised the issue before. I have recently met with the Principal and the Board of Governors Chair with my colleague Nigel Dodds, MP, around this issue. We are very keen as a party and the Principal are very keen as the Governors that a new school is put in, uh, in place uh, for Glenwood in the very near future. Can the Minister assure this House that, that there are no impediments to that and that that will actually happen? A new school will come to fruition for the benefit of the young people in the Greater Shankill and their education? Yes. And, and the Member will be aware that during our discussions around Malvern Street, we were always conscious about the knock-on impact, our perceived knock-on impact, uh, to Glenwood. I can assure the member that I remain committed to building a new primary school for Glenwood and, and ensuring that we uh, invest in the education for the young people in that area. I call Phil Slanningen. Uh, can I ask the minister, following on from a written response I re received from him last week um, on the potential issuing of guidance to schools and how to meet the needs of transgender students uh, with regards to uniforms, changing rooms and toilet facilities, whether he accepts that the issuing of guidance to schools uh, would be a welcome step forward to help them meet the needs of their students? I, I think it will be a welcome step forward, but I want to be in a position to send out informed guidance. and I have commissioned uh, a survey. Uh, across our schools um, to ensure that I am meeting the needs of LGBT young people within our schools. So a survey will, has been commissioned and, and will be 
uh, distributed to and information brought back to me. And once that information is back to me, then I will issue guidance uh, which uh, reflects the needs of our, of our uh, transgender pupils within our schools. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can he give me an indication as to, to whether he would be willing to engage with his colleague in the South, John O'Sullivan, um, who has also commenced the process of trying to develop guidance for transgender students, and whether he accepts that there is merit in not only surveying students here, but taking the, the views of the, the maximum number of people across the island of Ireland to develop best possible practice? More than happy to do so. I am due to uh, meet Minister O'Sullivan as part of an NSMC meeting uh, later this month, and I am more than happy to raise uh, that issue with her uh, and to see what information or assistance she can be to my department. Nelson McCausland is not in his place. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister when he thinks a review of the Youth Council of Northern Ireland um, will be presented? Um, I hope to be in a position to make an announcement within a matter of weeks. Uh, around that matter, there are still some details I require. And, excuse me, I have asked for further information from my officials uh, in that regard, but I am coming to a position where I hope to be in a position within a number of weeks uh, to make further announcements around the Youth Council. Call Claire Sutton for supplementary. Um, would the Minister be able to clarify the administrative costs of the Youth Council that he presented to the committee? Because from a freedom of information that I requested, it seems to be a discrepancy in both. Well, uh, the, the member, I'm not sure if the member's flagged up to me the apparent discrepancy. Uh, previous to this, it's very difficult for me, standing here at the dispatch box, uh, to know exactly what she's referring to. So I'm more than happy to, uh, or if the member wishes to follow that matter up with me, I'm more than happy to engage with her around this apparent discrepancy. The member listed at question number 10 has withdrawn their name. <coughs> Uh, and so that is the end of our period for questions to the Minister for Education.